I'm Ian Beaver, uh, lead research engineer, and this is Cynthia Freeman. And we were with Next IT Corporation, which was acquired like three months ago, so now we are at Next IT. <laughs> and today we're going to be talking about evolving chatbot interactions to meet the relational needs of humans. Hello, everybody. Let me make sure I adjust this since I'm quite short. All right, there we go. So conversational interfaces are everywhere. And conversational interfaces are essentially user interfaces that mimic chatting with a human. Now, they essentially allow for natural language interaction. With the rising prevalence of smart houses and self-driving cars, we need some way to be able to tell these devices what we need them to do. So we have these uh, simple command and control interfaces, which are an example of a conversational interface. But if we want to do something a little more complex, like converse on some topic, we're going to need chatbots, otherwise known as intelligent virtual assistants, intelligent virtual agents, or intelligent personal assistants. For the purposes of our talk, we're going to call them Intelligent Virtual Assistants, or IVAs for short. Pretty much any large tech company in the mobile sector has a conversational interface at this point. So Google has Assistant, Apple has Siri, Amazon has Alexa, Microsoft has Cortana. I myself use my Google Home every day. I ask it what the weather's like when deciding what to wear. I use my Alexa to change music, especially when I'm behind the wheel. And I might use Slackbot to set up a meeting with my office members, or you know, I might just goof off and talk to a Facebook celebrity bot. If I was rich enough and had a Tesla, I might use a Tesla bot and ask it to turn on the AC, given that I live in the deserts of New Mexico. Note that though, with that last example, that is a domain specific IVA. I wouldn't expect the Tesla bot to know how to help me with understanding my insurance claims, for example. So our work concerns task oriented, domain specific IVAs. Now IVAs are quickly replacing humans in the realm of customer service. Makes sense, one, they can work 24 seven. Two, they can always be polite and courteous, regardless of the mood of the customer, right? I mean, come on, some of us, you gotta admit, when you call in Comcast, whoo. Um, so, and thirdly, you know, they uh, can save the company's money. So, there was a Fortune 50 insurance company that reported that they had a 29% reduction in live chat volume within five months of deploying an IVA. Domino's cut their order times in half using an IVA. And it's actually estimated that by 2026, IVAs will completely replace human contact call centers. IVAs are also very cross-platform. They can be used in many different ways. Besides the obvious option of using them on your company website, you can use them on your smartphone, your smartwatch. They can integrate Facebook or Twitter. Um, you can even text them on your phone. Let's take a look at an example interaction between a human and an IVA. So in this example, the human's like, hey, can I take more than one bag on a plane? And the IVA not only addresses this question, but also pops up a browser window in the background giving some additional information like the dimension restrictions on the bags. And finally, the IVA provides several links to you know, related questions that this user might have. This right here is a prime example of a task-oriented IVA that's trained in the domain of airline travel. These kind of IVAs are the technologies that Ian and I work on. So Ian and I work for Verant Intelligence Self-Service, um, we have, for over 20 years, empowered others to better serve their customers and their, their employees. And we aim for a natural language interaction between humans and IVAs, and we've helped many Fortune 500 companies do this, with around uh, 40 production-level IVAs as of today. 
We leverage that cross-platform power that IVAs bring to foster customer engagement and our IVAs see a lot of usage. We're seeing like 500,000 user turns a single day. So a natural next question might be, okay, cool. I see that IVAs are being used a ton. I see what your company does, but how do these IVAs work? What's the internal workings of them? Everything centers around a user intention. You may have heard that word with the previous talk if you were in this room. And the intent is the interpretation of the statement or question that allows one to formulate the best response. So for those machine learn learning practitioners in this room, think of it as like the class in a machine classification problem. As an example, suppose I say, hey, can I bring my Rottweiler Frida with me on the plane? Well, the intent here is travel pet policies specifically for dogs. So as you might expect, there are many intents. In fact, there can be thousands for a single IVA alone. So how does an IVA capture and understand these intents? So in this figure here, we've got this user, this guy right here, and he's gonna ask a question. And that question gets fed to the automatic speech recognition component, or the ASR, which is just gonna convert that audio signal to text. That text is then fed to the natural language understanding component, or the NLU. Now, many other similar systems are going to have you know, more or fewer components than what we have in this picture, but every system is going to have that NLU. And that NLU can be implemented in many different ways. It could be a set of regular expressions. It could be a classifier. It could be a set of manually crafted, very carefully designed rules. But regardless of the implementation, it's going to be fed to the dialogue management system, which is going to recommend an action. So let's say I ask, what's my flight status? Well, in this case, the action could be check up flight status in external database Z. The action is essentially just a set of steps that the IVA needs to take to get all the information it needs to generate a good response. So the action then gets fed to the natural language generation component which outputs some response text and is fed to the text-to-speech component, which converts it to an audio signal for the customer to hear. So now that Cynthia has talked about the machine side of the uh, communication or conversation, I'm going to spend a little time talking about the human side. So we humans are relational creatures, as we all know, assuming we're human, this is a artificial intelligence conference, so that might be debatable. Um, <laughs> but we relate to, relate to one another oh, through conversation. I'm going to stand back here. It scares me. Um, we relate to one another through conversation. So as we converse with one another, we're passing like context, and um, it it's, it's, um, consists of a lot more than just facts and figures, but we have reasons and motivations, and there are topics that we discuss that we feel strongly about. We want our positions validated and understood. So we're not just talking to pass information. We want you to know not just what I said, but why I said it. In customer service, this is uh, very important because both parties are using these relational strategies to build trust. It's important that the customer service representative trust the customer so that they know that they're not trying to scam them or the company they work for, that their needs are legitimate and should be addressed in a timely fashion. On the other side of the equation, the customer needs to trust that the customer service representative is capable of handling their issue and won't mistreat their information. If the customer feels like the customer service representative can't help them, they may try to you know, escalate the conversation to a different party like a manager or to uh, maybe a different business unit or something. And as a customer, we want the customer service representatives to take our side. So if I call up some company and my, like my phone's broken, it's under warranty, I need it replaced, or maybe my cable's out or something, I'm trying to convince this person that you know, my needs need to be met. I have this phone, it's under warranty, it should be replaced. And I'm trying to persuade this person that um, you know, they should really, really take my side in this case. And so I may use strategies like justification. I say something and I justify why I said it. You know, my phone's broken, but it's under warranty. I'm justifying why, you know, it should be fixed. 
If that's not working, I may actually go so far as to try and manipulate the person, like um, persuading them, trying to appeal to emotion, their humanness, like, you know, um, you know, if the cable's out, I'm missing my favorite show, um, you know what that's like, or, you know, you talk about maybe there's a death in the family and this is why you need to travel last minute. And um, we humans, we do this all the time. We don't even really necessarily realize we're doing it. So what's the problem with this? Well, as we have these intelligent virtual assistants, and they're here to help us, and if we just naturally talk the way that we talk to another human, we inject this additional language that's carrying a relational content. It's not purely just factual or um, information to you know, meet some task or something. And here's two examples of what is the problem here. So on the left-hand side, we have a conversation, and the person says, I need a new ticket. My dog ate my last one. So that's probably a lame excuse, but um, this is a justification. They're justifying why they need a ticket, like I need one. It actually, my old one got destroyed. But the problem is, when this additional language is included, that concept of pet, my dog, and the concept of needing a new ticket, um, the IVA misunderstands and thinks they're talking about getting a ticket for their pet. And so it responds with like, okay, it's a $100 fee for that, and like, here's all the policy with traveling with pets. So it completely understands the point. On the right-hand side, we see this other agent. He says, I can help you with all things sim only. So the person says, well, I dropped my phone last week when I was on vacation. I bought a new phone. Can I swap my sim? In this situation, the user is providing what's called self-exposure, background information. They're just kind of explaining like what caused them to you know, have the question that they have. So they talk about being on vacation, their phone got broken, they got a new one, but now they're just wondering if they can swap sims. And this is something the agent itself has said that, you know, this is what I help you with is, you know, the questions related to sims. But all that additional information, all that background information there uh, is confusing. And the IVAs here have been designed in such a way that they assume all the text that is inserted there is all relevant to determining the business response or the, you know, the actual task intent. And under that assumption, they're trying to fit all that text into a, or a specific intent. In this case, the agent misunderstands and picks up on the fact there was a broken phone. So it says, you can find out more about how to insure your phone on our website. The idea of relating with a chatbot or an IVA isn't really a new one. In fact, the very first chatbots, um, Eliza from the 1960s, uh, with the famous doctor script where it was um, emulating a psychotherapist, and then later in 1970, Perry, which was emulating a, a paranoid schizophrenic, they were designed really to talk to humans in a relational way and sort of um, convince the people that they were, in a sense, real. But there's a very big difference between these early examples and, and modern IVAs. Modern IVAs are really there to help humans perform a task. They're, they're trying to make our lives more efficient. And they don't really expect, or at least um, they're not clearly designed to expect, this relational component that these early chatbots were sort of just designed to leverage and, and um, deal with. I've already gone through a couple examples of what relational language looks like. On the last slide, we saw the user with the dog and getting the ticket was justifying why they needed a ticket. It's, it's sort of like a means to try and convince the, the, the IVA to work on their behalf. In the example with the broken phone, that whole you know, story about being on vacation, breaking a phone and getting a new one, is all considered backstory. It's just background information that we as humans like to tell so that people can understand us better, when, what we're talking about, why we're talking about what we're talking about. Another common thing that we do as humans is we greet one another. So when we start a conversation, we say, hi, how are you doing? And we start talking. This is sort of just a polite thing to do. Um, but if you think about it, why are you greeting a machine? Like, I mean, do you expect it to be happy to talk to you back because you greeted it or upset because you didn't follow, you know, uh, this protocol of greeting one another? So here's an example of something we might see. Hello, my father is elderly and takes a while getting on a plane. You offer boarding assistance. In this example, we actually see two different types of relational language. We see that greeting, hello, followed by some background information. My father is elderly and takes a while getting on a plane. This is really just there to kind of clue the agent in on why they're talking about boarding assistance. 
And you notice if we just like stripped out that underlying text and removed it, the, um, the primary intent isn't lost. We can still easily determine that they're asking about boarding assistance. As these IVAs are becoming increasingly human-like, we're giving them personalities and like things they like and dislike, we're giving them avatars, we're giving them human voices. Um, we were sort of interested in like, how often are we getting inputs like this, where people are injecting this background information, these justifications and these relational strategies that really um, are not the point of the IVA. So we did a study. So Ian has given a very interesting example where the use of relational language on the user's part might actually make it kind of difficult for the IVA to detect you know, the customer's intent. So how can we empirically show this? Given that we design and build IVAs on behalf of other companies, we have access to a treasure trove of information, specifically conversations between humans and IVAs. So we decided to look at the IVAs in the domains of airline, telecommunications, and train travel. Now, each of these IVAs has over a thousand intents. They can take speech and text as input, and they're also very human-like. They have simulated personalities and, and interests. We randomly chose around 2,000 conversations for each of these IVAs. We also wanted to compare human to human relational language usage to human to IVA relational language. So we decided to include TripAdvisor.com airline forums data because we observed that the intents that were in there were very similar to the intents in our airline's IVA. We also just took a look at the data and noticed that there were several different types of relational language. So the most obvious ones are the simple hello and the polite thank you. So we have greetings and gratitude on this list. Another one is backstory. Suppose I say, hey, IVA, I want a ticket to Washington State because I want to visit my family for the holidays. Now, the fact that I want to visit my family is not necessary for intent, but it is backstory. Similar to backstory is justification, which is where the user argues to the IVA why the IVA should take action on the part of the user. So let's say I bought a new cable box, and it's broken before I could even use it. So I would argue to the IVA that the product is at fault and not me, because I didn't even touch it. Maybe because of this really unfortunate incident, I began to complain excessively, and this is ranting, which is a means of expressing displeasure when the conversation is not progressing in the way that I think it should. Maybe the IVA actually resolves my issue in the end, so I'm like, you are awesome, IVA. Or maybe the IVA just doesn't do anything for me, and I start to swear at it. In both of these instances, I'm expressing emotion. Now note that these uh, relational language types are not mutually exclusive. Like, I could say hello and thank you many times in the same conversation. And for those instances where there's no relational language, I would categorize that into other. So now that we understand about the different relational language types, let's take a look at the frequency of them in each of those four data sets that I talked about. So, we had some very lucky reviewers, lucky, um, tag for the presence of relational language in each of those four data sets. And uh, the result of it is this heat map. So let's take a look at TripAdvisor. It has like a value of around 0.6 for backstory. And what that simply means is that 60% of the conversations in TripAdvisor have backstory in them. So this actually makes sense if you think about it, because TripAdvisor is that human-to-human -human data set that we wanted for comparison. But keep in mind that backstory is not just present there, it's also present in human-to-IVA conversations. There's about 40% for telecom and 30% for backstory. Now, I apologize because it looks like the projector has decided to wash out some of our colors, but trust us when we say that express emotion is also present in some of these other data sets with about 10% for telecom and about 5% for airlines. It's there, trust us. Um, also, 
we notice that humans tend to think humans more than they would IVAs, makes sense. And also, relational language tends to be kind of domain specific. So for example, the train data set tends to be, tends to have the least amount of relational language out of all of these. Now, I didn't put it in this slide, but we also analyze a lot of other things like the co-occurrence of some of these relational tags. And they make sense, like people who say hello tend to say thank you, but people who rant a lot, usually they don't say thank you. Um, so now that I've gone over these relational tag statistics, let's take a look at that main question that we wanted to cover. You know, if we have relational language and it's using, being used more frequently by customers, is that actually going to hurt the IVA's ability to help the customer? So on a super ultra high level, we decided to conduct this experiment to answer this question. So we know where in all these conversations is the presence of relational language, right? And it's because we had reviewers tag for it. So let's go ahead and just remove all of that relational language and feed that to the IVA and get some responses. If it's the case that the IVA response to the cleaned relationless request does a better job of addressing the user than the IVA's response to the original request, that means the IVA is really suffering from the presence of relational language, right? So we gave reviewers, some new reviewers, three things. One, we gave them the original user question. Two, we gave them the IVA response to the original user question. And three, we gave them the IVA response to the cleaned relationless question. And then we asked them, hey, which one, which IVA response do you think does a better job of addressing the user question? If you think it's the IVA response to the original request, give it a, ne a tag of negative one. If you think it's the IVA response to the cleaned relationless request, give it a tag of one. If you're just not sure if you think both of them are doing a not so great job, then give them a zero. So the result of this annotation process is shown in this figure where the x-axis shows the mean response value from those annotators. So you can tell from all four of these data sets, there's a positive skew here. Most reviewers thought that the IVA response to the cleaned relationless user request did a better job of helping customers. This shows and highly suggests that there's a measurable negative effect to having relational language in user requests. So given that's the case, as Cynthia pointed out, that this relational language is present and people are actually um, tacking that on to their business intents as they talk to our IVAs today, what do we do about it? Well, there's really only two things we can do with those relational segments. The first thing is we can just ignore them, which is what we demonstrated on that last slide. If we just simply take those relational segments of that user input and ignore them while determining the uh, business intent or the task, it does really seem to help the intent recognition. So our IVAs, you know, it eliminates misunderstandings on the part of that relational language. But this doesn't really improve the IVA's relational ability. We're not getting closer to more human-like experience where the IVA is responding in such a way that we would expect a human to respond. So the second thing we can do is we can deal with it. Given that you've figured out the, um, the, the position of these relational segments within that user's input, you can determine which relational strategies are in play. So from that list, things like greetings or uh, ranting or something. And based on that, you can decide how you want to modify the task's response in light of the relational components that are present. So for example, you could have a rule where you say, well, if anyone greets us, we can reciprocate that greeting. We can greet them back. Or if someone's ranting, we can begin with an apology, like sorry that you're having a rough day or something like that, and then continue on with helping them through their task. So this is like an example approach of a way that you could implement a system that figures out the position of this relational or additional language and then deals with it. So here we have the original human turn in this gray box. This is the input to the system that the 
contains possibly additional or relational segments. And you can first pass this through your natural language understanding component, like the um, you know, typical, this could be implemented however you have it in your IVA, but really it's just trying to look through and see, okay, how do we understand what this person said? And you'll get some sort of a score out of that. It could be a confidence score, it could be a classification score, but you'll get some measure that tells you how well does that language fit to something in your knowledge base. Then, you can take that same original human turn and you can split it up using all combinations of punctuation and conjugations. So in grammar, conjugation is a word or phrase that joins other words or phrase in the same sentence. Um, it's basically a way to put two ideas together in, in, in the same sentence. And an example of this would be something like because, so that, words like that. So once you do this, you're gonna end up with a set of possible splits. So this, we call this, you know, the set of hypotheses here where each segment is um, uh, basically been broken out by either a punctuation or a conjugation. Then we can take each of those segments and we can pass them back through our same natural language understanding component and get the scores for each of those segments. So we have the score for the original input and we have the score for each segment in each of the possible splits. So using these two things, we can now attempt some sort of relational language detection. One way you could do this would be to compare the score for the original input in its entirety to the score of each of the components within a split. So if you say, for example, there's like component H1 maybe had um, a really high score and it was much higher than the original score for the, the intent, or sorry, the score for the input you might conclude that that segment, H1, actually contains sort of the task language, the, what the user's real intention is, is contained within that segment. If at the same time, the other components within that same split score very low, or maybe they're out of domain or out of vocabulary for that uh, natural language understanding component, you can conclude those are additional segments that don't help you determine the business uh, intent. So given that, you can go forward with determining your um, task-based response like normal, but now, instead of using the entire language, you just use the language of the one that scored much higher. So if you have a segment and you suspect that this is the one that has the business intent, you can determine the response to that. Then, the, the related, uh, sorry, the additional segments left over, you can pass them through a separate classifier. And this classifier has been trained to separate the different forms of relational language. So for example, it will label something as this is greeting language, or this is ranting language, or this is gratitude. And once you've had those labels on these additional segments, you can determine how you want to respond to each of those segments. So if you have, for example, a greeting, you say, well, we want to have a rule that if someone greets us, we're going to reciprocate that greeting. Then any time they say something like, hello, how's it going, something like that, you can just say hi. Using these relational segments and the labels that are present in them and your original task-based response, you can then generate the final response from the IVA. And this is now um, customized to the user's input. It takes into account the fact that we're reciprocating uh, relational strategies and we're also um, dealing with the task at hand. So let's work through an example of this and kind of see how this would work. So taking that um, input from before, hello, my father is elderly and takes a while getting on a plane. Do you offer boarding assistance? If I were to split this on punctuation, I would end up with three segments. I would have hello, and then I would have my father is elderly and get, takes a while getting on the plane. And the third segment, me, do you offer boarding assistance? If I were to pass each of those three segments through my intent classifier, only that final one would really have a high score because that directly relates to the intent of boarding assistance, which I would presume would be in a knowledge base for a travel or airline IVA. Then using that, the response to that segment, so how would you respond to someone asking about boarding assistance? Well, you might respond something like this. We offer escorted wheelchair assistance to the boarding area of the aircraft door, transfer to and from your seat, and transfer to personal mobility devices. This is a typical uh, response to someone talking about 
supporting assistance. And it's, it's perfectly acceptable, but it's very kind of cold and canned. I mean, it doesn't have any sort of uh, personal tone to it. Now, if we take those additional segments, uh, the one containing just the word hello, and the other one containing the background information, and we pass them through our relational segment classifier, it would label that first segment as a greeting. It would label that second segment. Um, we have a, an actor here, and we have some attributes of that actor, is elderly, takes a while getting on a plane, and taking to the fact that we know this is about boarding assistance, we can figure out that this is just background information. So maybe it would label that as backstory. Then, for each of those segments that are relational in nature, we can decide how we want to respond to them. And this is where, in practice, it gets a little tricky. Um, but for the purpose of the example, we could say something like, OK, if we have a greeting, we're just going to reciprocate. So they say hello, we just say hi. Then for that backstory, we recognize there's an actor involved, um, and we're talking about accommodation. So we could do something like you know, sort of some of the tricks that were played in the original chatbots, like Eliza, where you take portions of the person's input and you use them in the response. And we could say something like, we can certainly accommodate, and then the actor, your father. Then we can take these relational responses and the business response and put them all together and get something like this. Hi, we can certainly accommodate your father. We offer escorted wheelchair assistance to the boarding area and aircraft door transfer to and from your seat and the transport of personal mobility devices. Notice this is the same, we're dealing with the same task response, but now we've personalized it. We're reciprocating the greeting, we're acknowledging the fact that they're talking about their father and that we can certainly accommodate them. It's a much more personalized response, and it makes the chatbot seem a much more human. This is what we expect maybe a human customer service representative to respond with. So if you're interested in the study, maybe more of the details and um, some of the results we got, you can look this up. This is, uh, it's available at this URL. We published a journal article on it. And in addition, we released the data that we had annotated. So um, the data is available here at the second uh, link, and it has all of the relational segments hand tagged by humans. And there were um, all the different relational uh, segments, sorry, all the different segments were tagged with the relational tags so that you can work on developing um, really the uh, classifiers that were be necessary for doing the um, intent, sorry, the language recognition. And we hope that this can be beneficial to the AI community is to building IVAs that are more relational in nature. If you have any questions, we have time and we also have our contact information up there so that you can get a hold of us after the fact. Thank you. Have you tried to model humor and sarcasm as an emotional response? We've not tried to model that as a response. Um, recognizing sarcasm is actually a really hard problem, and there are many papers out there of people attempting to do it um, to various degrees of success. Um, you typically don't want a customer service, in the domain of customer service, being sarcastic. So um, for our purposes, that isn't really a need. Under, yeah, okay, so from the other side, getting that from the human. Yeah, um, sarcasm is, is, really, is a really hard thing to do because it's, it's cultural and personal in nature. Um, we haven't actually looked at um, trying to classify that in specific. It would probably just fall under, you know, it, it would depend if it would be ranting or backstory of how it would get classified. But. Are there any examples of this actually in production and or in your research? Have you looked into the latency, the impact on latency of response? Are you going to make people mad by taking so long running it back through this? Even more ranting. Yeah. So the latency is actually not too bad given that we're working with microtexts. We're not like um, applying this to blog posts or um, really long um, textual inputs. Generally, these are coming in um, from either a speech channel or um, you know, a typed IVA, so we don't see anything generally beyond like 200 characters. I mean, that's really kind of the, on the longer side of what we see. So 
doing the splits and the feeding it through the classification. Once you have the splits, you can do the classification in parallel. So you don't actually have too much overhead because you're not feeding it through one by one, but you feed it all through at once, uh, sort of in different threads, and then you can compare the scores. Um, it doesn't add too much overhead for the length of texts that we deal with, I guess I should say. Yeah, uh, a question. When you're doing voice to text, uh, speech to text, uh, usually comes out without the punctuations or the conjugations, whatever. The, so how do you split up and, and use that, which is a great idea, by the way, uh, to get that relational, relational conversation as you were mentioning? Yeah, so with the ASR, you, yeah, you don't get the punctuation. But the conjugations are words. I mean, they're, um, they're words or phrases, like because is a, is a conjugation. Oh, okay. So those are still present, and we can split on those. Um, without the punctuation, it, you definitely lose some element. My example, for example, for example, my example would break down. Um, but the uh, majority of the bots we work with are have text on the front end, um, so it's been pretty beneficial for us. Um, conjugations alone are, are something. Um, there are ways to do sentence boundary detection automatically. So you can sort of infer the punctuation even from an ASR by doing sentence boundary detection first and then using the boundaries as a stand-in for punctuation. Um, so for the relational text aspect and also more so in general, um, so you have 38 IVA, IVAs deployed across different domains. Uh, how do you sort of transfer knowledge from one domain to another if you do at all? Or are they mainly siloed and uh, use independent models? So our customers, kind of, or, sorry, our company is kind of interesting because we are sort of hired on behalf of other companies to build an IVA for them. So um, each IVA is almost like an independent entity in the sense that we build it on behalf of some other company and so that it can talk to that company's customers. But we have access to that data so that we can do this type of analysis and stuff. And we can transfer knowledge in terms of um, we have built up you know, libraries of um, intents and things that we can reuse when we start a new project that's in a similar domain and stuff like that. But the agents themselves are isolated by their very nature in that one might be for like an airline company, another one is for like a train company and they're existing in entirely different environments. So there isn't like any type of online shared data or knowledge in that way. So there's no like, so there's no, like core um, that's running underneath all of your deployed IVAs? Each deployment is essentially um, an independent uh, environment, in a sense. Um, with respect to things like, uh, well, sarcasm and maybe things similar, uh, do you have information or readings or about how much of a problem that is in practice? I mean, do people know that they're talking to a bot and don't use sort of that sort of line? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess one of the things that was sort of surprising in doing this study was um, the amount of relational language that is actually already in use. And one thing we didn't mention, um, these, some of these sets are actually fairly old. Um, they, um, so for example, this airline set was from 2013 that we sampled the data. The telecom set was from 2015. And already at that time, people were using um, backstory pretty frequently, like almost 40% of the time, people would give background information on why they were you know, trying to perform some task. And so I think it's just a very natural way of human communication. We don't even realize we're doing it. Uh, we just kind of inject that information. Sarcasm is pretty much regulated to people that are already mad. Um, like if the bot says something stupid, like um, these examples that we had, somebody might respond to one of these things sarcastically, like, oh, that was helpful. Um, we'll see that, but it's not really common that people are um, just being sarcastic while trying to perform a task. Sarcasm is usually an indication of a response to a misunderstanding or something. 
in, in the movie. It's really more a means to flag or identify a misunderstanding has occurred. It's not really part of what we're trying to do here, which is separate that from the, like the actual user's primary intention. What's a, what's a good sample size in order to train a, like a decent uh, bot? And in your models, do you use uh, purely machine learning or you mix it with rule-based systems? Sample size is completely dependent on the number of intentions that you're trying to recognize. I mean, if you've got 10, um, you can maybe do something like one-shot learning even and get a pretty good um, you know, classifier, intent classifier with maybe only 10 or 15 examples per intent, especially if the language is very independent, like, I mean, it's not a lot of overlap in the, in the language between the intents. So it's, it's really actually a hard question to answer. Um, we actually do a hybrid approach. We do a bunch of machine learning in the beginning, uh, and then we kind of use humans uh, to deal with uh, very contextual intents. So um, like where the input um, is dependent on like anaphora resolution and things like the input is dependent on previous inputs or ideas in a conversation. We'll have humans go in and um, basically build those um, intents. But the FAQ type stuff where it's just like input response and they're independent, that can be handled very easily by you know, classification methods. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks.